around two weeks. And lastly, once this webinar closes, you will get a follow-up email which has a survey, and the survey should open up automatically um, in your browser. So please fill that out. It would be great to have your feedback. We don't provide certificates, so that follow-up email will be your proof of participation. Great. And with that, I'll pass it off to Sue with the NCBDW. Thank, thanks so much. Good afternoon uh, from beautiful Philadelphia. I'm Sue Ostoff, and I'm with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. And I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on defense-based advocacy, principles and practices. Um, but before I go further, I just want to take a second to thank the FIPSA office, and that's the Family Violence Prevention and Services Program at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, I want to thank them for the support of this webinar and for their long-term support of so much of our work on behalf of victims of battering charged with crimes over the years. They started funding us in 1993. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. As you can see from the slide, Cindy Pizel is the legal coordinator here at the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. Um, we've been fortunate to know Cindy for a very long time here at the National Clearinghouse. She was an intern with us during her law school years, which is now a number of years ago. She then became a public defender here in Philadelphia, and she represented indigent people facing felony and misdemeanor charges. During her final year as a public defender, Cindy had a really rather unique gig. She practiced exclusively in family court, providing criminal defense to people accused of crimes involving the violation of a civil protection order. In 2008, Cindy rejoined the National Clearinghouse, this time as our legal coordinator. Uh, and we're delighted to have Cindy conduct this webinar. So I'll turn it over to her in just a sec. I just want to remind everyone, because I know some people have come on um, since we started the introduction, that I'll be collecting questions for Cindy from the chat box. So if you have questions, put them in there. I'll take them out. I'll, do, I'll acknowledge that I see your question. So if I don't do that, in the chat box I'll say, oh, Nicole, I see your question. If I don't do that, let, uh, you might want to send it again. And we plan to leave about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. And I will ask Cindy as many of your questions as I can. And if you are listening in only and have questions, you can um, email them to Pawab Kumar. So that's P-K-U-M-A-R at B-W-J-P.org. Um, and just one last thing. Pawab mentioned you'll get a short evaluation when you sign out. And he also mentioned, and it's true, so I want to underscore it, it's really helpful to us and the speakers if you'll fill it out. And it really will take you about a minute and a half. So if you'll take that minute and a half, um, and give us the feedback. We'd really appreciate it. So, Cindy, thanks so much for all your great work, and we really appreciate your willingness to share some of it with us today. So I'm handing over the virtual mic to you now. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Sue, and thanks also to Paula for um, handling a lot of the tech ends of things here. Um, we really appreciate that. So today, as Sue already said, we're here to have a have a talk about defense-based advocacy. I'm going to say exactly what we mean by that um, with a definition that comes from a resource that I encourage you all to explore when you can. Um, it's a toolkit, and it was uh, written by Jane Sadusky and our director, Sue Ostoff, who you just heard from. And a lot of the things that I'll be talking about today are spelled out in greater detail in that toolkit. So, you know, when we all kind of log off from here and, you know, go back to the other pieces of our job, I just think that would be a good first follow-up step to the information we're going to talk about today is to take, take a look at that, and I, I think you'll find it as helpful as I do. So, in addition to exploring defense-based advocacy, we're also going to talk about some of the things that get in the way of doing this work. Um, 
some tangible things and some things that are a little bit more invisible and have to do with culture and attitude. And in order to d dismantle those barriers, we're going to talk about some of the common ground that anti-domestic violence advocates and people in the criminal defense community have. And there's, and there's more than a lot of people might think. So we're going to go into some details about some of those shared values and principles um, that overlap in those two seemingly different worlds. And finally, we're going to talk about some really concrete things that community-based advocates can do to assist the victim defendants that they are working with. Throughout the, uh, the talk we're going to have today, if I use the term victim or survivor, I'll probably say them rather interchangeably, but I'm always going to be talking about a person who is experiencing power and control, a person who is experiencing battering. And that might seem like a bit of a no-brainer, but I point that out because the criminal legal system also uses the word victim to refer to a person against whom a crime has allegedly been committed. So if that's what I'm talking about, I'll, I'll say complainant, but with victim, I'm always meaning a victim of ongoing battering. Um, and that you know, distinction, or at least spelling it out that way, uh, that framework a long time ago, uh, we heard from Connie Burke at the Northwest Network. Let's start by just thinking about some of the labels and perceptions that get attached to people who are charged with crimes. And I'm not even talking about people convicted of crimes or people who necessarily have done time. These are labels and perceptions that get attached to people once they have experienced arrest or are perceived, actually, of having experienced arrest. It's kind of built into the culture that once that happens, you know, somebody um, is automatically different than they were before that arrest actually happened. And we know that because they're referred to as things like suspect or offender or I see now that my slide says pep, it should say perp. That's a common word that we hear, um, you know, in our jobs, at least for any of us that interact with the criminal legal system. But also it's, you know, um, social media and uh, pop culture is kind of saturated with language like that, you know. It's, you know, if somebody gets arrested, they're the suspect. And we have all heard that when people are in the criminal legal system as defendants, they have the right to a presumption of innocence, and that's true, and we'll talk about that more. But the ways that um, folks get perceived once they're arrested kind of belies that. It, it says that, you know, um, as a culture, we don't necessarily view people as innocent until proven guilty. So that's a really big barrier for people who have to go through the criminal legal system as defendants. Uh, victims of domestic violence, you know, face a very similar phenomenon. Um, once somebody says that they are a victim of abuse, you know, really whether it's domestic violence or whether it's sexual abuse or, or whatever it is, um, you know, there's an immediate knee-jerk reaction of disbelief. And I feel like this is something we've all seen pretty loud and clear over the past several years um, now, uh, or at least the past couple um, going through the Me Too movement. There's been a lot of focus on what it means to be somebody who claims to have been victimized. Um, there's a, there is a culture of disbelief there, and that can happen whether or not somebody even makes an accusation against a particular person. There's just um, victims have to deal with an automatic disbelief of whatever it is they have to say, sometimes before they even go into detail about it. So that's always been an uphill battle. Um, I think and hope that that's something that's actually getting better now that that um, culture of disbelief has kind of been put in the spotlight in a different way. But. You know, so uh, in, in one hand, you know, hold all the things that defendants um, have to contend with from a purely, um, um, you know, from a purely stereotypical standpoint, 
And in your other hand, hold the things that all victims have to deal with, you know, before anything is even examined or tried in court. And what you have is a lot of barriers right away for somebody who is a victim of domestic violence and a defendant at the same time. You know, those sets of perceptions that we just talked about come together to make the criminal legal system an even more uphill battle than it would be anyway for a defendant uh, who's navigating that system. So once somebody raises their experiences of abuse in court, excuse me, of abuse in court as a defendant, um, you know, there's definitely going to be some thoughts and attitudes and beliefs that come back at them about whether or not they're even a real victim, whether they're raising their abuse because it's going to be beneficial to them in some way in the criminal legal system, you know, whether they think they can get a free pass, which isn't a thing for victims of domestic violence, or whether they're just out of their minds. So victims always struggle with being believed, and when they're defendants, um, you know, that that struggle increases exponentially. Um, and, and sometimes I refer to this kind of constellation of barriers based on perception as the victim-defendant tax. Because when you're a victim-defendant, um, it's not just about assumptions that you're a bad actor anymore. It's not just about... Um, attacks on your credibility anymore. It's all those things plus the idea, you know, that maybe because you are um, a victim or because of your experiences, you're not necessarily considered worthy of the protections of the criminal legal system. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but I'm talking about, you know, the the not just the presumption of innocence, but like, for example, the right to um, use defense uh, to protect yourself and your children um, and those kinds of things. So, so yeah, it's perceptions about people, it's it attacks on their credibility, and it's whether or not um, victims actually get treated less fairly in the criminal legal system than some other defendants who have to move through the system. So anyone who's worked with a court-involved survivor, you know, a, a, a survivor who's navigating any kind of court system, uh, knows how daunting the process can be. And we're going to circle back to this, but the more information that advocates and other people who are working with victim defendants have, the more equipped that person is going to be to navigate those systems. Um, and, and I, I mean, I think this is true for anybody who is involved in multiple court systems, but I think it's particularly true for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault because those things come up in multiple contexts. And it can be almost impossible for folks to sort out, you know, what proceeding is what um, and what the, you know, goal and purpose of this courtroom is versus that courtroom. If somebody's in custody court, if somebody's um, dealing with protection orders, if somebody's doing both, these are all, you know, the nuances of those things and understanding them can have a huge impact on uh, people's outcomes in court. But if somebody is also a defendant, it's, you know, I would, I would argue it's even more important to have detailed um, information that you can give to a defendant about the way the system works. And the reason that it's, you know, that it's so important if somebody's also a defendant is because of the potential consequences of um, involvement uh, as a defendant and getting convicted, you know, the potential for state supervision, the potential for incarceration, that kind of thing. So, so being able to have information about what it means to move through that system um, in a way that's not going to be detrimental to the criminal case is absolutely, absolutely vital. Um, and knowing that, you know, that's why we like to talk about um, doing this work from a defense-based perspective or giving 
providing defense-based advocacy. Um, and as I said, defense-based advocacy as defined in the Clearinghouse's toolkit is the practice of extending community-based advocacy to victims of battering charged with crimes in ways that coordinate with defense teams to support creative and effective legal strategies that maximize opportunities for justice and help prevent further victimization of arrested, convicted, or incarcerated victims of battering. Um, and I would invite you to return to that definition because there's a lot there. Um, there's a lot there to hold up um, as, as advocates move forward in working with charged and incarcerated victims. And it's not just the nuances of the definition that's important. It's, it's understanding the tenets that, um, that underlie that definition and the tenets that underlie the principles of doing defense-based work in general. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about some of this stuff, but there's a lot to say um, about these understandings of defense-based advocacy. And so, again, I would invite you to refer to the toolkit and to talk with us if you have any questions or want more information about what some of these foundational um, principles actually actually mean. So first of all, um, underlying defense work, underlying defense-based advocacy is the fundamental belief that all defendants, not just defendants that uh, we work with in the anti-domestic violence world, but all defendants are entitled to due process and entitled to the rights and protections guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. And I know that, you know, saying that can sound, you know, kind of pro forma, but I just want to pause and really think with you all about what that actually means. You know, what we're saying um, is that we don't make a distinction between who we feel are good defendants and who we feel are bad defendants, who who we think are guilty, who we think are not guilty. Um, what we're saying is that every defendant, no matter what it is that she or he or they is accused of doing, um, has the right to be protected by the same set of laws that everybody else is protected by um, under, under our governmental system. And one of those laws is the presumption of innocence. Uh, for all people who are accused of crime. And again, I, I know I brought that up before, but I want to just, you know, pause a second and think about what that really means. It means that somebody who gets arrested for a crime isn't a perpetrator. It means somebody arrested for a crime isn't a felon. It means that somebody, unless and until they are uh, convicted of a crime, is considered completely innocent, that they walk into court with those assumptions attached to them. And that can be really hard to center when we're doing this work because we work with a lot of people whose partners do terrible things to them. And it, it can be really hard to, um, to understand why somebody who may have harmed their partner so incredibly badly is entitled to any set or rights of any kind under, under the system. Um, and that completely makes sense. But the better that the criminal legal system works at protecting all defendants, the better it's going to work uh, for victim defendants. The better it's going to work for defendants who face multiple oppressions that further undermine their chances in the criminal legal system, like racism, um, for example. And the better it's going to work for innocent defendants, come to think of it. So. It's only by um, holding sacred these fundamental principles are we making sure uh, that the people that we work with who go through this defendants are able to um, have the system, you know, have a, have, a, have a chance in the system of having it work for them. 
Another one of these rights that I'm talking about is guaranteed in the Constitution is the right to counsel. And it's not just having a lawyer, it's having a, an effective lawyer and a vigorous defense. Um, this is something that all defendants are entitled to. There's a lot of laws that um, dictate a lawyer's responsibility to their clients. And this is a principle that's true no matter who the defendant is. I know it can be pretty hard to um, watch a defense attorney defend somebody accused of doing terrible things. But again, the better the system works for the defendants accused of horrible things, the better it works for all defendants. And to be honest, you know, a lot of the times that when we work with victim defendants, they too are accused of doing horrible things. Um, and these protections are there, and, and I think this is maybe an important point to kind of wrap this section up with. These protections are there because the criminal legal system is not an equal playing field. Um, and what I mean by that is a criminal legal system, if somebody's the defendant, what that means is that the government is accusing an individual person of something. Um, and that government can bring all the resources they have to bear down on that defendant, whether it's investigatory powers, you know, the police, the, the, the prosecution, expert witnesses, whatever it is. Anything at their disposal they have in order to try to prove somebody's guilt. Um, and a defendant, you know, doesn't have a special government department dedicated you know, to doing investigation. So, th so that's why there's right to counsel, okay? That's why there's public defenders, at least in most places. You know, that's why there's the presumption of innocence, because it's built into the system that it ought to be hard for somebody to be convicted of and punished for committing a crime. Um, it, it, it's supposed to be difficult, and we could have many other webinars on the way that actually plays out, right? But that's, that's the design. So practicing defense-based advocacy, um, you know, working for victim defendants, requires not only an understanding of the ten tenants we just talked about, but an understanding that when it comes to the case, um, the defense attorney is more or less at the wheel. Uh, and what we mean by that is just that when it comes to somebody who's navigating a lot of things in their lives, um, and one of those things is a criminal case, any, you know, any of those things happening in their lives need to be um, approached with an understanding that uh, decisions made could, go, could affect the criminal case. So who a defendant talks to, who they work with, what they say to whom, you know, these are all things that um, can impact the criminal case. And so, you know, serious deference really needs to be there for, for, for the attorney. And the attorney's in the best position to understand what the consequences are going to be and how to best protect the defendant um, from unintended consequences. And that's not always to say that, you know, we see defense attorneys doing amazing jobs with every single case. And obviously, um, you know, we can, we can call out cases on the margins and talk about how, you know, maybe a defense attorney shouldn't have been the lead of a particular case. But as a principle, it's just really important that decisions about what is going to um, impact a particular case be directed uh, by the defense attorney. And right along with that is the importance of incorporating advocacy strategies that don't undermine legal rights and options for victim defendants. It's not always easy to tell what those practices are going to be, and we're going to talk really specifically about uh, some of them here today. Um, because our goal is, you know, at a minimum, to, to make sure that our you know that, that the advocacy practices that we talk about and that advocates in the field practice do not um, cause additional harm 
and so ways that that can happen within the criminal defense context are where we're going to spend a little bit of time coming up today. You know, going back for a second to um, when we talked about people who are accused of doing bad things and people who aren't, you know, just remembering that there's a list of behaviors that we all engage in every day. There's a list of behaviors in our relationships, the partnerships that that we all engage in. Um, the same thing is true for people who batter their partners and for people who are surviving battering at the hands of their partners. Um, and we're never going to be able to tell which of those things are illegal or illegal by looking at just who's doing it, right? In other words, we know that there's a lot of things that people who batter their partners do that aren't remotely against the law. And we also know there's a lot of things that people who are surviving battering do that are completely against the law. So, you know, that being said, whether or not something is legal or illegal, whether or not somebody is charged with or convicted of a crime, that's not going to give us the information that we need to know whether or not somebody's surviving battering or somebody's perpetrating battering against their partner or somebody's doing neither. Um, the reality of, of what's going on in an intimate partner relationship is not something that the criminal legal system um, is equipped to give us a clear answer on. So doing defense-based advocacy um, is a crucial part of the work that advocates do. Um, people who are navigating the criminal legal system often are you know, some of the most marginalized victims that advocates work with on a regular basis. And in saying that, you know, it's important to recognize and, and be fully aware of all the barriers that can get in the way of doing this work. And I, I know that it's all well and good and easy to say that, oh, all, you know, advocates should be working with defendants and, and, and that the reality is that there are some really um, real circumstances that can get in the way of, of doing that work. And it's not just resources, right? We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. But resources, obviously, are an issue in all the kinds of work that we want to do. But there's barriers, and there's attitudes, and there's you know a laundry list of things that once we recognize and once we call out for what they are, um, we can be in a better place to dismantle some of those things so we can you know work together you know moving forward to to do some of this work for defendants. So first of all. Um, at the Clearinghouse, we hear from a lot of advocates over the years who have earned, uh, through a, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, some really solid and important and you know, dynamic relationships with the police and the prosecutors in their communities. Um, you know, it, it it was a long struggle for, in a lot of communities, for this to happen. Domestic violence advocates were saying, you know, hey, police and prosecutors, you need to respond to domestic violence um, in a way that's appropriate to recognize it as the crime that it is, and that, you know, started to happen, and the criminal legal system became one of the places where domestic violence uh, was addressed. And so, you know, these relationships were fought for, and these relationships are important. And so it's, you know, for some advocates in some communities, doing defense-based work um, is a scary proposition because of the thought that doing it might undermine these, you know, these hard-earned relationships that community-based advocates have with police and prosecutors. And, you know, that. That completely, that completely makes sense. 
Um, and the, the reality is, though, that community-based advocacy programs are just that. They're, they're community-based, and they um, you know, were not started to, to work in tandem with any organization. They were started to work on behalf of survivors. And so getting kind of regrounded in that reality um, is really important because, you know, survivors are the, you know, are the deciders of what their, their realities are, not the system. Um, and so I think with those principles in mind and, you know, working with police and prosecutors who can understand that nuance and understand how different their roles might be from community-based advocates, you know, this doesn't always have to be um, a barrier. It, it's not something that necessarily is going to be dissolved in a short period of time in any given community, but shifting, you know, perceptions and attitudes about advocacy work back to um, survivor-defined place can go a long way into um, clarifying that working with defendants is is not anti-prosecution; it's pro-survivor. Um, another barrier that 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 we see, um, you know, is that for for so many years, community-based programs were either um, wary of being accused or had actually been accused of gender bias when it came to um, deciding who they were going to serve. Um, as we know, you know, gender is not the only factor that goes into unpacking the dynamics in any intimate partner relationship, but it is a factor, right? And so, you know, being accused of gender bias um, or being afraid of being accused, you know, obviously I think that that fear can multiply if, okay, not only are we working with survivors whose partners are being prosecuted, we're working with survivors who are facing criminal charges, and if what that looks like is that we support only women, no matter what quote-unquote side they're on, that can be a problem. You know, and, and that's really real, but I, I think programs are doing really good jobs at being gender inclusive in many ways. The services reflect that. So it's not just involvement in the criminal legal system where programs are having opportunities to um, support victims of all genders. Um, it's in other parts of, of their work and in the communities as well. You know, so, so it, it feels like that particular barrier is getting a little bit easier to navigate these these days, and I hope that that's um, your experience as well. We've heard from programs for years about uh, not working with perpetrators. Again, this kind of reaction to um, a victim defendant seeking services at a program just can, can show in some situations a program that, you know, has been aligning its definition of who's a victim and who's not with who the criminal legal system says is a victim and who's not. And it's, you know, again, it's understandable when, when the um, anti-domestic violence work going on in the community is all criminal legal system based, when the funding tends to be all criminal legal system based, this is the kind of perception, I think, that, that can pretty easily happen. And that's when it's more important than ever to remember that the system doesn't get to decide or make that distinction, um, that the system is set up, uh, is not even set up to make that distinction. What the system is set up to do um, is to, you know, investigate um, and, and put on, investigate criminal activities, put people on trial if there's enough reason to believe that they participated in them and punish them accordingly. Um, and so that you know that's pretty different than from this, you know deciding who's committed intimate partner battery hasn't right. Funding restrictions can can be a huge barrier again not just for doing defense 
faith-based work, but for doing everything. Um, we know that funding can be harder and harder to come by, um, and that when we do get it, we want to make sure that our funders are happy. So, you know, looking at funding restrictions is a couple things to say there. Um, I would encourage everybody who is worried about the limitations on VOCA funding to kind of go back and review the changes that have been made about the rules uh, under VOCA because it's not as restrictive as it once was. Um, but also, lots of times programs get money from lots of different sources, and some of those sources don't have any restrictions on doing work with charged and incarcerated people. Um, and, you know, like doing any work, adding anything to the caseload, it can feel like so much extra. And we're going to talk about some advocacy strategies. Um, in a few minutes, and many of them can really be done in the framework of work that most programs are already doing. Another barrier, which can be a little bit more invisible um, that I want to talk about now, is the line drawing that can happen about who counts as a victim and who doesn't, depending on what charges they face. I know I talked earlier about, you know, not letting the criminal legal system dictate who's a victim and who's not, but, you know, we see this breakdown among people who are charged as well. Um, you know, for example, a lot of people, um, you know, in, in anti-domestic violence work and out there in the world can get on board with the idea that sometimes victims of battering have to use force to defend themselves against their abusive partner. You know, some self-defense cases, you know, okay, there's kind of, there's kind of a narrative there, there's going to be buy-in, maybe, that that person um, is a victim of battering who is um, deserving of and entitled to support services community. Um, but take that, you know, that same survivor and and imagine that she's faced with charges of, of, you know, killing a third party or charges of child abuse or something like that. And it gets a little bit harder to, to get on board with the idea that, that this, this person is still a survivor who is in need of support services. But there's nothing about anything a survivor could be charged with that could make them uh, not a survivor, that could make them unbattered. You know, I think anybody who's done direct service in some kind of way has worked with or, or encountered survivors who have done, who has done some things that we're not comfortable with or, or that angered us or, or, or inspired strong feelings of any kind. But those things are not... Um, they don't cancel out somebody's experiences of abuse, the fact that they're a survivor, the fact that they are in need of support and services, um, just like all survivors are. Court culture is another barrier that can be pretty invisible to people, I think, unless they're looking for it in their own work. Um, and what I mean by court culture is, you know, how the day-to-day -day operation of uh, legal spaces, legal proceedings are set up and what kind of messages does that set up give to victims and other people who are going through the system. Um, and let me explain what I mean by that by talking about one of my own experiences I had as a public defender here in Philadelphia. Um, when I was a pretty young public defender, 
all of the misdemeanor domestic violence trials and the felony preliminary hearings for domestic violence cases would be heard in one of two courtrooms. And, you know, I was assigned there quite a bit as a young defender. I walked in and my clients were all kind of seated, you know, seated at one side of the courtroom. Um, police officers and, and complainants were usually seated at the other side. Um, I would be trying to locate all my clients and talk to them, especially the folks that I hadn't had a chance to connect with yet. And there was a bunch of people on the prosecutor side running around and talking to police officers and checking in witnesses and answering the phones and helping people sign subpoenas and chatting with the judge and going into the back and doing all these things. Um, and the folks who, who were doing this would, you know, sit on the other side of the complaining witness the complaining witness would be between this person and the prosecutor. Um, and, you know, while a trial or a hearing was going on, maybe they'd be whispering together, maybe, you know, they'd be handing tissues, what, what, whatever it was. But I didn't know that these people were advocates from one of our uh, community-based advocacy programs. Um, you know, they were talking to the prosecutor's witnesses. They were answering the phone. They were chatting with the judge. And they were working with the prosecutor. And I assumed um, that they were employees of the district attorney's office. So in other words, I had no idea uh, that there were people in the courtroom who could provide much needed support and assistance and advocacy for the clients that I had who were in battering relationships, I had no idea. And what's more significant and important than that is that none of my clients knew that either. And it's not because anybody told me that or it's not because anybody told that to the defendants. It's because that's what it looked like. Um, you know, being on the other side of the room, being very involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the court and working so closely with the prosecutor, you know, my assumption was that whatever services they're providing um, are not for my clients. And so paying attention really closely to what things look like in court uh, can, can be, I mean, it feels like a simple step and maybe, and maybe it is, but I think it can be very, very important in making sure that our services and our work are getting to, uh, to all survivors. Uh, and not just to survivors on one side of the courtroom. Another barrier um, is just that there aren't very many communities in which there are strong relationships between community-based advocates and defense attorneys. This isn't, you know, this obviously isn't a blanket statement. This isn't always true. But in a lot of communities, um, these two groups of people have just not done a whole lot of work together. At a bare minimum and at a maximum, they've uh, been in uh, situations where there was animosity. So there's ways to, to kind of chip through some of that and break that down. And I wish I had more time to talk about that in a fuller manner. But kind of understanding where that's coming from, I think, is the first step. Um, looking back at the history of distrust, if it exists in your community, and why it's there um, can be really beneficial if you're trying to actually dismantle that distrust. Um, I think, you know, I think at the Clearinghouse we've seen that in a lot of communities there's a fundamental misunderstanding about the roles that defense attorneys and community-based advocates have respectively and with each other. There's a lot of assumptions that get made for good reason. Um, you know, in some cases there are other reasons sometimes. Um, but really kind of being able to 
to define and, and say out loud what somebody's role is can can move somebody, I think, a long way towards, you know, seeing that defense attorneys and advocates are often best positioned when they're on the same side, right? Um, so for defense attorneys like me, who had no idea that a community-based advocate could even work with my client, that would be step one, right? Um, understanding what they what they do, understanding that their mission is to support survivors and not systems, understanding that they uh, don't do their work at the behest of prosecutors or that they're not going to betray confidences or, you know, that kind of thing. That's kind of so important. And on the, you know, on the other side of the coin, for uh, advocates to have a nuanced understanding of where defense attorneys are coming from, that they're working there to try to equal that playing field to try to make sure that uh, marginalized people have voices, um, and they're not there because they want to see the streets team with criminals, um, is, is a really important first step. And that kind of goes into, into another barrier or thing that gets in the way is incorrect assumptions about each other's agenda. Um, I think, you know, people in any profession make a lot of assumptions about why other people do what they do, right? And yeah, some of those things are uh, deeply rooted in misogyny or, or you know, or, or other kinds of oppression. And they definitely need to be unpacked, but, but getting together and having conversations about where the drive to do each other's work is coming from can really go an incredibly long way in aligning advocates and defense attorneys to work together in a meaningful way. In breaking down these barriers, there's, you know, at the Clearinghouse, we, we see that it can be really helpful for people to kind of go back to the, to the foundation of advocacy. Um, and not only, you know, make sure that the, the work that is happening reflects the mission statement, but understand what the mission statements and values and principles and philosophies are of allies like defense attorneys. Um, and we'll get to this in a minute, but, but, but you know, for advocates who do that, I think they see a lot of common ground. Um, it's also important, and the, again, this sounds really kind of simple and kind of 101, but God, so important to just, you know, take a step back and, and figure out in any given um, office or program or community or whatever it is, like what what's defining the work and, and when, when we can't do something, where is that coming from? Is that based on an assumption or is that based on something else? And, and the reason I bring this up is because, you know, it's pretty common here at the Clearinghouse that we'll hear from a defendant who tells us that their local program can't work with them because they don't work with defendants. And so, uh, you know, maybe we'll give that program a call to get, you know, some clarification on who, um, on who is, is in the service area that they, you know, what kind of work they do and who they do it for. Um, and, and what we learn is that, of course, they serve defendants. Like, of, of course, they do defense-based work. And it's just, um, you know, just kind of a, a leftover assumption from the past that they don't. So I can't even tell you how many how many times that's happened and that you know when we have further conversations with people when we try to you know break down what they're seeing as a barrier to working with somebody they find that the barrier that they thought existed such as the policy or a funding restriction actually doesn't exist at all and it was um, the, whether the assumption 
was like a holdover from a different, you know, set of principles or whether it was something else, um, we find that it's sometimes not there and it doesn't have to be a barrier. And then finally, you know, getting the right people in the same room together is something that's invaluable, is something that's absolutely crucial to moving forward with uh, ensuring that anti-domestic violence practitioners are doing defense-based work. So that means defense attorneys and advocates getting together. That means, um, you know, reentry folks being in that room too. That means that, um, you know, that means that people figure out where their shared missions what their shared missions are, where their values overlap, and make sure they're all on the same page moving forward. Um, public defender's offices often welcome training opportunities, um, and defense attorneys could stand to learn a lot about domestic violence. Um, and on the other side of it, um, having local advocates hear from defense attorneys to kind of um, get more context about the work they do and demystify some of it a little bit. These kind of, of meetings and cross-training opportunities and getting together are the kinds of things that foster the relationships that allow defense-based advocacy to take off uh, in a community. This is also, you know, one of the concrete advocacy strategies that I promised at the beginning of this but I put it on this barrier slide because one of the things that can get in the way, you know, can, can, can get between victim defendants and services from community-based programs is just simply that they don't know they're invited. You know, it's not just that their attorney doesn't know, it's that they don't know. And so saying it out loud can be so helpful and important. You know, not just saying, yeah, we work with people who are experiencing domestic violence, but we work with people who are experiencing domestic violence and are also criminal defendants or, or something much more artful than that, but being really deliberate and explicit about the fact that your services at a, at a program are not, um, are not something that are unavailable to defendants or incarcerated people and saying that out loud can really um, can really go a long way. And along with that, it's, you know, I think programs are really good and strategic about, you know, figuring out where to put information about their programs, whether it's, you know, in hospitals or in uh, beauty shops or, or in colleges, but also jails and prisons. Um, is if we want to make sure we're maximizing the amount of survivors who know about the work that community-based programs do, jails and prisons have to be included on that list because our jails and prisons are absolutely full of survivors of abuse and trauma um, and other kinds of abuse. So, I talked a little bit about cross-training opportunities, building relationships with defense counsel, but I want to step back for a minute and just talk about probably the most effective technique that we've seen um, here at the National Clearinghouse is the cold call. And, the, and what I mean by that is um, the strongest relationships that we see between community-based advocates and defense attorneys often happen when a victim in a community gets charged with a crime and that advocate picks up the phone um, and, and calls the defense attorney. Now we know, you know, this, in saying that I, I realize it's not the most efficient way to uh, create a culture of including defense-based work, it's, it's what we've often referred to as social justice one person at a time. But, but that being said, it's extremely effective and it builds a lot of bridges. And having advocates and defense attorneys put their heads together 
um, for the support and representation of a single survivor who has charged the crime is incredibly powerful and definitely has a ripple effect in the communities in which it happens. And then as, as I alluded to earlier, there's so much power in understanding roles. There's so much power in understanding shared principles and shared values. And so I want to spend just a minute talking about some of those shared values and principles. Um, and these are also in the toolkit that I referenced earlier that you can find on our website um, and in the link that's been included in the chat a couple of times now. These are also really helpful to go back to when contemplating doing defense-based work, is reflecting on the common ground that's actually there. So both defense attorneys and community-based advocates, they're the people who are on their client's side, even if and especially when nobody else is. Defense attorneys and community-based advocates are there to help and not to judge. Defense attorneys and community-based advocates both believe in the right to the information needed to make informed life decisions. And in fact, a great deal of the work of defense attorneys and community-based advocates is centered and designed around making sure the people that they work with get that information. Defense attorneys and community-based advocates believe and work according to the belief in the right that people live free from unjust interference by those with more societal power and privilege. Defense attorneys are often fighting the power of the state. Advocates are often helping uh, their survivors resist violence by their abusive partner and resist the power of the state. So this is very much common, common ground. And finally, defense attorneys and advocates uh, share the belief in the right of equal access, safety, and justice and that that access should be unhindered by racism, classism, or any other form of oppression. So keeping those shared principles in mind, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about some more strategies about working with battered defendants. And then um, I'm excited to get to the questions that you all may have. One of the reasons that it's so important to incorporate defense-based work um, into advocacy programs is that experiencing domestic violence can raise the risk of arrest actually in a number of different ways. So let's, let's just talk about that for a minute. First of all, for a family who is experiencing domestic violence versus a family who is not experiencing domestic violence, you know, one of those households, the police is going to be more likely to show up, whether because they're called by somebody in that household or a neighbor or whatever. So. Crossing paths with the police is something that is just more likely to happen um, if battering is taking place. We also know that there's a lot of things, as we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of things that people do to survive battering that are, in fact, criminalized. And therefore, because they're criminalized, the risk of arrest goes up. Um, you know, I can't go through the whole list of survival strategies here, but just, you know, some of the big ones. You know, some people have to use force in order to defend themselves or their families. Um, some people 
you know, have to get kind of economically creative if they're going to uh, support themselves and their families because they're a victim of economic abuse. Um, some people are coerced into criminal activities by their abusive partner. Some people, ha you know, turn to, um, you know, drugs and al alcohol for as coping strategies, or they're coerced into using drugs and alcohol. Anyway, there's just so many ways in which somebody's efforts to try to survive every single day um, are something that can get them involved in the criminal legal system. Um, and, you know, the biggest, the most common reason that somebody gets arrested is for um, substance possession, use, distribution, you know, some kind of nexus with uh, with drugs and people who you know as I talked about a second ago people who are either self-medicating or who are coerced into using controlled substances you know not only is that going to be a battle while they're actively experiencing abuse you know that could turn into a battle even if they um, get to a place of relative safety because um, that addiction might remain so my point in saying all of this is that there's just so many things about a survivor's life that raises the risk of arrest. Whether or not um, a survivor has ever been charged with a crime, therefore, um, it's important for people to know what their rights and options are if they find themselves in a situation where they could be subject to arrest and domestic violence advocates are in a great position to ensure that people have this information. Um, you know, talking about knowing your rights is one of those discussions, you know, that can get extremely complicated, especially for people who might very well be in need of a police response in order to get safe from their abusive partner. But that being said, it's still something that's important for people to have on hand. And so for domestic violence uh, advocates who work with survivors, whether they've been um, in contact with the system or not, working with public defenders and local organizations on what kind of information is most helpful in any given community um, can be so helpful to survivors. And I say, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's things that are true everywhere, but, but there's practices and um, cultures in communities that are going to shape the kind of rights that it's most important for people to be aware of. You know, f for example, a, a rural response is going to look a lot different than an urban one. A community with a lot of immigrants in it, it's going to look a little bit different than communities where there aren't a lot of immigrants, that kind of thing. So local programs can work with um, their defense bar, their public defenders, and other organizations to kind of shape what it is that survivors need to know uh, should they be uh, encountered by the, the police, um, either at home or elsewhere. Oh, let me go back for a second. Pre-arrest safety planning can also include planning for uh, bail should an arrest happen. I know that you know we don't want to take all the survivors that you know you work with on a, on a daily basis and and scare them and convince them that they're going to be an, arrested. But safety planning that advocates already do can enfold. Um, provisions for what happens if the safety plan, you know, needs to cover situations where an arrest happens. So, so making sure, you know, if possible, that there's a source for bail and that the, you know, the kids have a, a place they can go that isn't necessarily back to the abusive partner, if that's an option, or notifying somebody at a survivor's place of employment. All of these things can be enfolded into a safety plan. A lot of these things are there anyway. A lot of these things are there anyway, but, but you know, being um, being deliberate about accounting for the possibility of arrest can be very, very helpful and can uh, actually help survivors get out of the system quicker than they would otherwise because there's already been a plan put in place. 
And that being said, uh, early identification of victim defendant is one of the key things that advocates can do to help survivors who are involved in the system as defendants. Because the sooner somebody is identified, the sooner that advocates can work together with attorneys to help people get out of the system. And the sooner that survivors are out, the greater chances they have to minimize uh, the impact that that arrest had on them. So other than making sure information is in jails and prisons for survivors to access, um, accepting, accepting collect calls is something that's extremely uh, helpful for people who are incarcerated. Obviously, this isn't something that's always possible, but in places where it is, you know, a, a, a program, you know, somebody who accepts charges might be the only person that that survivor can call. And so figuring out if that's a possibility at a program or if it's not having a plan on who's going to be on the other end of that call is, is huge. Um, Having involvement in pretrial arraignment or detention hearings or whatever it is in your community that happens early on in the process, you know, obviously that's that's not going to tell you who all the survivor defendants are, but it, but it's going to be extremely helpful in identifying some of them. So some communities might have people who sit through all the pretrial arraignment. Um, people who do that can get an idea of what people are charged with you know, sometimes even what they look like at arraignment, you know, if there's visible injuries and that kind of thing. Um, so anything that, that advocates can do to uh, make the possibility, uh, put the possibility of an early intervention on the table can be, can be huge. Um, having relationships with local bail funds can be a big part of this. Um, more and more we see communities in which uh, a nonprofit organization of some sort has set up a bail fund to help people be released pretrial who are being held you know, on an amount of bail that that program can afford. And having, for advocates to have connections at these things um, can be really huge in helping survivors get out pretrial. So, Sometimes it's just even a matter of learning what's in your community. I know that there, are, you know, some communities are are going away from cash bail right now. But for those who still have it, having connections at these programs can be huge um, for survivors who end up incarcerated. It's really, you know, when, when possible, if a survivor who uh, who can make bail and doesn't have to rely on her abusive partner to be the one that makes that bail can kind of, um, you know, put a little bit more power in that relationship where it should be and not give the abusive partner one more tool um, with which to control the victim. Advocates, and I'm going to breeze through some of these things because I'm noting the time right now, um, but a really important advocacy tip is avoiding discussing the facts of a defendant's criminal case. And we know, you know, that this is one of those things that can really cut against the grain for advocates because advocates are not trying to censor what a survivor tells them and doesn't tell them. But what they say about, you know, defendants, you know, have the right to remain silent and what they say can and you can and will be used against them in court, um, you know, it, it, it's, really it's really true. Every time a defendant tells their story to anybody, that story is then vulnerable, and that criminal case can therefore be potentially undermined. Um, and I say this even, you know, knowing that so many communities have really strong confidentiality laws in place that protect the communication between victim and between uh, the advocates that they work with, but there's, you know, there's there's ways in which those protections can be undermined. Um, you know, sometimes something gets said in court that could arguably open the door to those usually confidential communications, 
or sometimes there'll be a circumstance like the presence of a third party that can render those sessions no longer confidential. And so really the best practice is to just not have the information in the first place and that way it's not vulnerable. And I'm only talking about discussing the incident that gave rise to, the, rise to the criminal charges. I'm not talking about anything else. So advocates can, you know, still work with people and still talk with them about uh, her experiences of abuse, what she needs to stay safe, the criminal process and the community, safety planning that gets done, um, the effects of incarceration, and that kind of thing. Um, I want to fast forward now because I want to just break down what I mean when I'm talking about making sure that the survivor has information about what to expect going through the system. Um, Cindy? Yeah? I just want to say that at this point we have one question, so that oh. I, if you want to keep going, I think you don't need to speed through these so quickly. Okay. Great. So then I won't. Um, just getting back on track here. Yeah, so working with defendants and avoiding talking about the facts of the criminal case, again, I said it cuts against the grain for a lot of advocates, and that's so true. And I think that's because, you know, what advocates have learned is that it's so important for survivors to be able to tell their stories. And so if defendants aren't able to tell them to advocates, who can they tell them to? So um, advocates can be so crucial in helping defendants find a new way to tell their stories. And this is always true, but this is also especially true when those survivors are also defendants because unfortunately, they're gonna be hearing a lot of opinions from a lot of people, including their own lawyer and including the judge about what they can say to whom and when, okay? So, you know, for example, I think, you know, a lot of victims who, especially those who don't have experience with the criminal legal system, either as a complainant or as a defendant, might see court as their opportunity and place to tell their story. And in fact, court might not be that thing for them at all. And advocates can, can really help uh, survivors, you know, understand why that is and, and figure out a different uh, context in which that story can be told. You know, attorneys might advise their clients not to testify in a case because that's the better legal strategy in terms of getting a good outcome. But for a survivor who just wants everybody to know their truth, that's not always um, something that's so easily understood, easily received. And part of also, you know, helping a survivor um, get on board with protecting her legal rights and options and uh, not telling her story in a way that's going to undermine them is by talking with survivors about not contacting the prosecutor directly. Um, because, I mean, I think most prosecutors would, would, you know, would not necessarily take that call. They'd encourage them to go back to their attorneys, um, which is the right thing to do. But the, the opportunity to reveal any information at all, whether it seems harmless or not, could be something that ends up undermining the case, particularly if it's against the uh, legal strategy that's being set up uh, by the defense attorney. So now I'll go back to talking about knowing the system. Um, and I got to say, this is one of those advocacy strategies that makes an immediate difference in the lives of uh, victim defendants. When somebody is navigating a system that they've never gone through before and that they don't know anything about, um, 
the more information they have about what is or isn't going to happen when they walk through those doors, the better. And I say on the slide that no detail is too small to be helpful, and I would say it's the small details that are particularly helpful. I've, you know, time and time and time again, um, you know, I've seen it where victim defendants who, you know, in their lives, right, they're, they're, they're navigating surviving and being battered and protecting their children, and now they have to go through this court system as well. And, you know, it's terrifying. It's terrifying because punishment is on the table. You know, being accused of breaking the law is something that's happening. You know, there's it, just, just so much at stake. And so to be able to take somebody's anxiety from an eight down to a five or six can be extraordinary, and, and it can actually help people uh, be better advocates for themselves. It can help people work with their defense attorneys better. So things that you know anybody who's in court every day or every week might take for granted are things that it's really helpful to say out loud to survivors. For example, you know, when she goes in for the first court hearing, you know, will that be her trial or is that something else? Is the judge going to ask her anything? Will she have to sit in the chair up front? You know, who are all the people in there? There's, you know, there's a guy with a badge, there's a guy on the computer, uh, there's people sitting at tables, there's people, you know, coming in and out from the back. Like, who are these people? Uh, you know, it's so daunting to to know that a bunch of private things about your life are going to be talked about in open court in the rooms full of strangers. Um, the whole process around getting a lawyer, when does that happen? How does that happen? Is it possible that she's going to have to answer questions about income? Will she have to pay for her own? Where will her abuser be? during this process. Will he be in a different room? Might he be in the same room? If he is in the same room, what can we do to be safe? Um, what's appropriate to wear can be huge. I mean, that's definitely true for all defendants I've ever worked with, no matter what they're being charged with. Um, you know, if she's in jail, will she be allowed to wear her own clothes? Can somebody bring her clothes? Will her kids have to see her in handcuffs? What will happen if she tries to talk to her family? Like all these things, all these day-to-day, in-and-out things, knowing the answers to tiny little questions can really put survivors in a position to be able to, to work through the system uh, much better equipped. Um, you know, there's the practical sort of getting to court stuff that, uh, is, is also true with non-criminal matters as well, you know, where to park, you know, where the courtroom is, can she bring her cell phone, uh, who should she talk to, those kinds of things. No, seriously, no detail is too small, and working with defendants on that level is so incredibly helpful. Um, let's circle back to a thing that I alluded to a couple of minutes ago about talking with the prosecutor. For advocates who want to incorporate this as an advocacy strategy, it's something that can be incredibly, incredibly helpful and effective, but it's so important for advocates to make sure that if they're going to do this, that the defense attorney is fully on board with that strategy. Um, and the reason is, is because otherwise there's a risk that harmful information might be revealed um, and that the defense strategy can be undermined. And I'll give you an example of, uh, of a case, you know, where that happened. You know, uh, a self-defense case, you know, where a victim of battering is being badly threatened by her abusive partner and he gets in her face and she punches him in the face, right? Um, he calls the cops. She gets arrested for assault. Um, 
she be, she works with an advocate who gets her permission to go talk to the prosecutor, and the advocate lets the prosecutor know that the whole thing happened in self-defense. Well, um, the problem with that is that that might take a lot of actually better options off the table for the survivor at that point. For example, the prosecutor may have already talked to this particular complainant, decided that he was, you know, completely full of it and was going to dismiss the case before they learned that that punch had actually happened in real life. So that's just an example, but it can play out in many different ways. So if 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 negotiating directly with the prosecutor seems to be like something that's going to be an effective strategy, um, just make sure that the defense attorney is fully on board with it and knows the steps and um, preferably is even there for that conversation. I've already talked about some of these things in a general way, but court accompaniment for people who are on bail or even people who are not on bail, just being present in the courtroom um, can be tremendously important. Anybody who's done legal work in any context that has seen the power that this can 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 have and and for defendants uh, i mean I, I think i think it can be even more profound because they're not just facing an abusive partner who's coming up against them again again they're facing a system they're facing the state um you know the the, the prosecutors in there representing the government as an adverse party just so for a defendant to have somebody sitting in that room who is not an adverse party <laughs> is amazingly amazingly powerful A lot of uh, community-based programs and, you know, some people on the coalition level do reentry work, whether they call it that or not, and focusing there can, can be huge. And again, it can be replicating some of the work that programs already do to help survivors, um, you know, whether it's about helping them navigate and find housing, um, reestablishing documentation. You know, we know that when when survivors maybe leave their abusive partner, sometimes they they need to reestablish their their credit cards if they have them and their driver's licenses and everything else. This is definitely true for people returning from jails or prisons. You know, a lot of the time, um, documentation, even if they had it going in, it just tends to disappear. So that can be a really solid, helpful way that a program can work with uh, reentering survivors financial resources, obviously everybody wants those, but helping uh, reentering people connect with whatever is there can be, can be crucial. And then figuring out what's going on in your communities with regards to uh, criminal record stuff. This, things are changing very quickly with the options that are available to people about getting things off their record and how to do that. So knowing expungement processes and possibilities um, in your communities and working with survivors to effectuate some of that stuff um, can be a great first step in helping people get back on their feet. And I don't want to completely run over time, so I think I'm going to hold it there. Um, and invite you all once again to take a look at that toolkit I talked about at the beginning of the presentation and ask Sue now if there's any questions for me. Uh, there actually are a couple questions. Um, uh, Natasha, who's from Colorado, had a question that's geared toward um, working with a defense attorney as a community-based advocate on a specific or with a specific client. And so the question's uh -huh. about confidentiality. And so she's saying that like their confidentiality is set up so that they could um, they could talk about their case without fear of them being subpoenaed as advocates. So they would say uh -huh. something like, I can't confirm or deny that this person is my client. And she says, which would bar us from communicating with defense attorneys unless we had a release, which we still would likely not do considering the risk. So it, she's sort of asking, as I understand it, like what could they do to sort of overcome that? Um, I think um, one of the ways to overcome that 
is to talk with specific defense attorneys about formalizing uh, an advocate's relationship as part of a legal team. And so, uh, you know, that's going to look different in different communities, and, and that would likely involve some kind of written document. But um, attorneys have, you know, c consult with different uh, people and experts and um, team members on a variety of things in all kinds of cases. You know, so, so just like an, um, a defense attorney might involve a psychologist or might involve use of an expert witness, a defense attorney might very well need a community-based advocate on the team. And that being said, um, as a member of the legal team, then communications would arguably fall under attorney-client privilege. Uh, there might be nuances to this in different communities that you know kind of look different but that's a place to start is asking the defense attorney whether establishing that more kind of formal relationship would uh, protect those communications thanks and Dean and I said to Natasha that we could also talk with her after this is over to talk through some of her questions in greater detail um, yes. and unfortunately Jessica we're not going to have time to get to your really important question about how to support um, survivors who are justice involved when kids are involved and the kids are being placed with the abuser or in CPS. And uh, Cindy and I suggested to Jessica that maybe we set up another call where we could have people do some brainstorming about ways of providing support to criminalized mothers, basically, uh, which is so many of the people we're working with. Absolutely. So I'm sorry, Jessica, we're not going to be able to get to that today. Unless, Dean, you want to add something right now in the last minute. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it doesn't feel fair safe to the person. topic. Yeah, right, exactly. So because that, that's such a serious topic, so for Absolutely. sure. So, uh, Dean, we have just a minute left. I don't know if you have any last parting words that you want to share before we sign off. It was just so much valuable information. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, I, I just want to invite and encourage um, anyone who's listening to to contact us if you're working with a victim defendant or if you wish you were working with victim defendants or if you just want to talk more um, about incorporating this work or furthering it or changing it or whatever it is please reach out to us um, that's what we're here for and we would we would really love to hear from you and work with you Thanks so much. And Pav and Jane, who is our really amazing captioner today, thank you so much for all your help. And um, to be continued, thank you. Thank you, Sue.